So guys, what we're going to do today is we're actually going to start a two-day conversation. Um, but this is a conversation that slowly turned into two days over the last couple of years. Um, so what you're going to find is that when I originally pulled this material together, um, I used to teach all of this material in one day, which you're going to quickly appreciate was somewhat inappropriate. Um, and so consequently, when you look at the homework assignment today, there's going to be portions of this that you're not going to be able to do simply because we haven't covered the material. Um, so the way that today is going to unfold is we are going to talk about what's the big idea. Um, and this is actually how we're going to wrap up chapter five, which means soon we'll be in chapter 19, which is why you have the chapter 19 outline due on Wednesday so that you're prepared for Friday. Um, but guys, what we're gonna do to wrap up chapter um, five is we're gonna answer a question. And what you're gonna find out is that question actually has three different answers or perhaps three different paths to get to the same answer. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm gonna lay out for you the question. Then we're going to talk about that question conceptually. And this is going to sound familiar because it's how we ended class last time. Um, but it's important that you connect with this. And guys, I think that you're starting to appreciate the idea that this is probably a little more in depth than perhaps you're giving it the benefit of being. Um, when we all of a sudden start talking about heat and enthalpy and all of a sudden signs matter and context is important. And I, I, think, I think we're maybe not pushing this as deeply as we can. Um, I think part of the reason for that is because um, I, I think we're starting to get a separation in the class. Um, this is common, um, but typically what I see is that typically about the middle of this unit, we have some people that are starting to think this is really interesting and I'm finding this compelling and I want to keep going and I want to dig deeper. And then I see other people that start to think to themselves, I'm really not sure what's going on in here anymore. And this doesn't feel good. I'm not really willing to work, do the work to get on top of this. I just know it doesn't feel good. And it's interesting because you kind of get this fight or flight syndrome thing going on. And what I'm seeing in some of you is you're getting giggly, you're getting twitchy, you're getting distracted. And guys, quickly what you're gonna find out is that just isn't gonna work. Because my goal, my job in this room is to not convince you to care. It's not to convince you to work. It's not to convince you to get engaged. My very challenging job, guys, is to teach you the hardest stuff that you've ever learned in your life. And guys, understand that if you're starting to have that response that says, I'm going other directions, because understand, I have no room in my day or my hour or my life to try to get you to care. Um, frankly, the fact that I've already had to move a couple of you and I'm considering having to do that with others, guys, that's, that's junior high school crap. That's not what college looks like. It's not my job to make you wanna care. It's not my job to keep you engaged. It's my job to work my butt off to try to help you be successful. So with that said, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to lay out this concept. We're going to come back to it. Once we've wrapped our arms around the concept, we're going to talk about the three avenues through which we can approach this interesting question. And we're going to talk about the experimental, empirical way of approaching this today. Then when we come back on Wednesday, we're going to look at the two computational ways of approaching the question. And that will be our conclusion of chapter uh, five. And we'll jump into chapter 19 next time. So guys, the question then becomes, what is the question that we're trying to address? And it's this. Um, you may remember this because it's actually where we, we didn't directly get to it, but we did talk about the chemistry. We talked about the idea of thermochemical equations. And we talked about the idea that if we take a mole of methane and react it with two moles of oxygen, we get two moles of water, two moles of carbon dioxide. And then we brushed up against the idea, and we talked about it a lot today in grading homework, that we've got this delta H value. So guys, let's talk not only about what that means, but let's also talk about where this energy is coming from. So guys, what does it mean that delta H is negative? 
that it's exothermic. Because the minute we talk about exothermic, we've got a system and we've got a surroundings, right? What's our system when we say that this is exothermic? It's the carbon atoms, the hydrogen atoms, and the oxygen atoms. Guys, in chemistry, almost always we define our system as the atoms that are involved in the reaction. So we've got our one carbon, our four hydrogens, our four oxygens, and these are our guys, and they go in and they come out, and when they come out, as Ari got us thinking, they come up with about 900 kilojoules less energy than they went in with. Because there's a lot of energy that comes out of this reaction. So the question is, physically inside this reaction, where's that energy coming from? Where do those 900 kilojoules of energy come from, Mark? What about the bonds? Be more specific. No. Forming. Guys, this is the formation of bonds. So the idea is if we look at our products, guys, the products are the things that are created as bonds form. And anytime bonds form, energy is being released. But does that mean that when two moles of water forms and one mole of carbon dioxide forms, does that mean 890 kilojoules of heat are released? The answer is no. And I think, Mark, this is where your head was going because that's not the only thing going on. What's happening to the reactants? They're breaking apart. And guys, this takes in energy. And as energy goes into the reactants, over here bonds break. And that is an endothermic process. So bonds breaking is endothermic, bonds forming is exothermic, and we know that the exo is greater than the endo by a factor of about 890 kilojoules because that's the overall amount of energy that's given off by the reaction. Do you understand the chemistry behind what we're talking about? Is that okay? Do you have questions? Go ahead. So let's do this, and we're gonna talk about this in just a second. Let, let's go back to calories. So how much energy is a calorie? Do you know the definition? One gram of water, one degree Celsius. So can you picture a milliliter of water, those silly little yellow cubes that I've had in class? So that's a milliliter of water. If you put a calorie of energy into a milliliter of water, its temperature goes up a degree Celsius. It's not very much energy. calories that we think about. Those are kilocalories. So a, a food calories, a thousand of them. But let's try this. So 4.18 joules is a calorie. So a joule is about a fourth of a calorie. Does that make sense? So four, approximately four joules is one calorie. So joules are even smaller than calories, which isn't much energy to begin with. So now let's talk about kilocalories. Okay, so the idea here is if 4.18 joules is a calorie, then a kilocalorie would be a thousand joules, right? Um, so that would be about, I'm using round numbers, about 250 little calories. Do you see how I did that? So if four, if four joules is a calorie, then a kilojoule would be about 250 calories, but that would be a quarter of a dietary calorie. See what I'm saying? So it's, it's not not very much energy, but it is our unit of energy. Is that okay? Did, and we're going to get into the, those sort of those ideas in just a minute. So guys, other questions? Go ahead, Jeanette. Yeah. So it, it gets into something that almost borders on the spiritual. Uh, and it really, what is energy? Right? We know it when we see it, right? I've got no energy today. You're full of energy today. Hey, gasoline contains energy. We talk about energy very casually, but then the question is, what is it? And, and why is it given off when bonds form? And so in this universe that we exist in, there's this currency called energy. And energy is the ability to change stuff. And it turns out that when bonds form, when atoms turn into molecules and form bonds, they are less able 
to change stuff. That, that stuff that we call energy goes down when bonds form. And when it does, that energy is released and it's transferred to the surroundings and it happens in one of two ways. It transfers through heat, which means that the, 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 as the bonds form, they, um, they, they impart energy to the surroundings by speeding the surroundings up as they slow down and bond. Um, or they can also transfer energy through work, but we're not going to talk about that. But in either case, as bonds form, you can literally, and we're going to draw diagrams of this soon, literally what happens is as these atoms come together to bond, they settle into a position of lower energy. And when they do, that energy is released in the form of heat or the form of work, which we don't talk about, but they literally settle into a lower energy state. So if you want to then break those bonds, you've got to get them out of that lower energy state. And maybe this makes more sense because to do that, you're going to add energy back and it re-excites those atoms and they break apart and, and separate from the molecule into their individual atoms. Does that make sense? It's, I know, but it's crazy because it, it always happens this way. One of the few things you can bank on in this class is if a bond formed, energy went out. It always works that way. Every time. Go ahead. It has nothing to do with this. And I know that last year I sort of misrepresented that and said, but maybe you caught this, that when nuclear processes happen, we say that's the breaking of the strong nuclear force. No, it's not. Because we now know that to break anything, you've got to add energy. And so actually the breaking of the strong nuclear force is endothermic. The energy that's given off, like in a nuclear power plant, is actually the conversion of mass to energy and Einstein's E equals MC squared thing. So it's completely unrelated to this. Yeah, no. Go ahead, Alicia. Oh, gosh. No, no, yeah. <laughs> is this going to come back and bite you in the butt later? No. So, guys, Elijah's getting nervous because he's going, wait, is work just something we're ignoring now and then you're going to come back and this is going to get crazy later? And the answer is no. Um, perhaps, depending on where you end up, maybe your sophomore or junior year in college, if you become a chemistry major, will they bring work back in? Um, if you become an engineering major, it typically comes back your freshman year. Um, you'll, you'll start taking classes called statics and dynamics um, as a beginning engineering student. And typically at that point, uh, eh, or maybe not, it might even be thermo, your sophomore year as an engineer, it'll come back. But for us, no, we, we don't talk about work. You won't need to. You guys okay? But that's a good point, Doug, say that again. You do in physics, absolutely. Yeah, and the reason is because physics is more concerned about the macro rather than the micro. And on the macro scale, you can't ignore it um, because it's, it's a present thing. So, you guys good on the idea? Okay, you may want to write this down. Guys, you know that I function organizationally. And so the question that we're now going to ask and answer is this. Guys, how on earth do they know? How do they know that if you burn a, bowl of, a mole of methane in, a, in, a, in the presence of enough oxygen to make it go, that you're going to release 890 kilojoules? How do they know? And guys, the answer is we can figure it out experimentally. That's what we're going to do in lab. Or we can do it computationally. And that's what we're going to do on, on Wednesday. But guys, it goes like this. So how do we know the values for delta H? Where do we get this enthalpy change data? This is sort of the organizer for our next couple days. So guys, how do we know this enthalpy change data? Well, one of the ways we can do this is empirically. You guys, do you remember what does empirical mean? Experimentally. That's called calorimetry. You can actually become a calorimetric chemist. That's a job. It's a thing. You can get your PhD in calorimetric chemistry. But guys, there's another way that we can approach this. And I hope you find it as interesting as I do. 
Still not sure if you guys are interested in going into the sort of the interesting depths of material. I'm getting the sense that for some of you get there and then it's time to giggle. But um, guys, I look forward to digging into this with you on Wednesday because we're going to talk about what's called Hess's Law. And guys, Hess's Law is actually the math that allows us to figure out these delta H values without ever having to do an experiment. Now, it's actually based on other experiments and data we look up in tables. But guys, we can handle this through what is called manipulation, or we can handle this through what is called computation. And it was really neat when I started teaching this because I learned them in college separately. What I found out when I started teaching it is it's actually the same thing. What you'll see on the AP test is they're going to lead you to solve these one way or the other. Given the data that they give you, they may ask you to do it through manipulation. They may ask you to do it through computation. So I'm going to show you the connections between the two, but what you're going to find on the AP test is it'll be clear, use one or use the other. So I'll teach you both. But at a little bit higher level, you're going to find out they're the same thing. So guys, what we're going to do today then is we're going to live right here. Here. We're going to talk empirically about how we come up with, with these values for delta H through a process called calorimetry. Bless you. Ready to go? Okay. So guys, in order to do this, we need to share a couple terms. For those of you that are in the lab, this is going to uh, bring some clarity to some things that were perhaps confusing. So guys, as you were digging through the pre-lab, you ran into this word, specific heat capacity. So let's do it quick, just so you have a reference. Guys, grab your AP equation sheets. Jessica, tell me you need one. There you go. Oh, can I just give you one anyway? Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a family thing. Guys, does anybody else need one? You guys all okay? Do you? Anyone else? You're good, David, are you okay? You're good? Okay, anyone else? All right, here we go. How do you guys lose these? All right. Hey, so guys, turn to page two, if that's really, oh, page four, which is page two, depending on what you do with the blank back of the periodic table. And guys, looking down in the lower left-hand corner of what is numbered page four, you'll notice it says thermodynamics and electrochem, but it says thermodynamics, and at the very top, there's an equation. Q is equal to MC delta T. And then you'll notice off to the right, if you haven't picked up on this yet, they give you guys all of the definitions, if you will, for the, the variables. So Q is heat, M is mass, and C is specific heat capacity. And then delta, you know, is change in T is temperature. But guys, they always give you the decoder key. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to talk about this thing called C, lowercase c, which is specific heat capacity. And guys, it goes like this. I would encourage you to write this stuff down. So guys, specific heat capacity is defined as the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of a substance's temperature one degree Celsius. So guys, the units then for that number are actually joules per gram Celsius degree. How much energy in joules is needed to raise one gram of water's temperature, one degree Celsius? Now guys, this, yeah, good, good, good. You're making the connection. So what is the answer to this question in calories? How much energy is needed to raise one gram of water's temperature, one degree Celsius? One calorie. The answer is one calorie. So guys, the specific heat capacity of water is one calorie, but we're going to do it in joules. So it's 4.18 joules per gram per Celsius degree. So 4.18 joules of energy will raise one gram of water's temperature, one degree Celsius. Yeah. 
So calories are the metric unit, joules are the SI units. And you're gonna find out that um, calories are too gross. They're actually too big. Um, because while we need kilojoules to talk about enthalpy changes, we're going to need joules in chapter 19 to talk about entropy changes. And it turns out that even joules are too big to talk entropy changes. So if you were to use calories, the scale's not right. So it's easier for us to just stay with joules all the way through. No, no, no we're, we're going to talk not about entropy. Oh, yeah. So joules are smaller than calories. No, this is, is yeah, no, go ahead. Well, so we, we don't use joules in the U.S. We actually use British thermal units. Yeah, the BTU. Um, so scientists in the U.S. use joules and perhaps we use calories. You know, on our food, we're used to reading in calories, but neither of those are English units. The English unit of heat is actually the BTU. Um, so like if you go to buy an air conditioner for your home, they will tell you how much heat the furnace puts off in BTUs and not in calories or joules. If you were to buy that same air conditioner in Europe, they would tell you in joules or calories. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, the, the Brits got off the English system with the rest of the world. Yeah, the only ones that are still on it are like us in Myanmar and one other place in Indonesia. Yeah. Yeah, go us. Yeah. What does this have to do with like volts and watts, like electricity? A lot, but not at the level you need to know it. So guys, the question was, what does this have to do with volts and watts and power and energy? And they're all they're they're all interconnected at a level that you don't need to worry about in here. Okay. All right. So guys, with all of that said then, this this value specific heat as, or specific heat capacity, those are interchangeable, is denoted C on the AP cheat sheet, and you will find it in the equation Q is equal to MC delta T. Right, right. Go ahead, Samuel. Um, it is in the other setting, but here, and notice there's no confusion because the way it's on the AP cheat sheet, the AP equation sheet, it's, it's given to us properly. But you're right, we also do use C for the speed of light, but you wouldn't get them confused because it clearly doesn't fit here. Is that okay? Okay, so guys, all of this then needs to be contrasted with this. And this is not just a word game, this is important. There's another quantity that is called heat capacity. Not specific heat capacity, but heat capacity. Let me give you the definition and then we'll talk about the differences. Guys, heat capacity is the amount of energy needed to raise a system's temperature one degree Celsius. So guys, what's the difference between specific heat capacity and heat capacity? Or maybe what are the similarities? So we've got a system and we've got a substance. We've still got one degree Celsius. We've still got amounts of energy. But what are the differences? One gram versus the whole thing. So guys, when we talk about specific heat capacity, it's for a gram of any substance. But for heat capacity, we're talking about the entire system. And understand that's something you can't look up in a book. And we're gonna talk about that more later. You can look up the specific heat capacities for any substance on the planet. They're actually all in that book right there, the CRC reference. And you can look up the specific heat capacities for any solid, liquid, or gas that exists. Because you can't look up the heat capacity of a system because your system could be different. And so this isn't something you look up. This is something that you actually have to determine experimentally, which is what we're going to be doing in lab on Wednesday when we calibrate our calorimeters. So the units for this then are in joules per Celsius degree. 
Notice there's no gram. And guys, this is denoted capital C, and you find this in the equation, capital C is equal to heat divided by delta T. So guys, let's make sure we're making sense of this before we put this in context. So here's what we know. We know that specific heat capacity is the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of a substance's temperature one degree Celsius. Is that okay? Then guys, heat capacity is the amount of energy needed to raise a system's temperature one degree Celsius. Notice the thing that's different is the amount. This only works for the system as identified. The other is whatever substance it is per gram. And we're going to leverage both of these um, as we get deeper into what we're going to do with this in class and in lab. Yeah. So, yeah, in order to look it up, yes. Yeah. So it would have to be something you can define, whether it's an element or a compound. It would, because if it's got impurities, then those impurities would change the specific heat capacity. And then at that point, you couldn't look it up because it wouldn't be constant. Does that make sense? Okay. Guys, other things you want to talk about here? Or are you okay? You guys are good? All right. So now, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to take these ideas and we're going to push them into the practical. And we're now going to talk about what is called coffee cup calorimetry. So, guys, make this the next thing in your notes. And what, I'm going, what we're going to do together is I'm going to show you a coffee cup calorimeter. And then we're going to draw it together. And then, guys, we're going to spend a good portion of the rest of our time together talking about how these things work. Then once we figured out how these things work, we're actually going to go solve a problem quickly and then we'll have a little bit of time to work on your homework. So guys, fundamentally, don't try to draw this. This is a coffee cup calorimeter. You can carry out a reaction where you've got styrofoam cups that are stacked that cause insulation. And then we put a lid on this in order to further insulate it. And then guys, in a coffee cup calorimeter, you've got a thermometer and you've got a thing that stirs. And then in there, eventually you add a sample and you watch that sample either gain or lose energy. And as you do, you can study heat exchange and therefore enthalpy change as processes take place within this thing. So. With that said, we're going to draw one. So guys, grab a blank spot in your paper and let's draw it together. So to draw a coffee, coffee cup calorimeter, we need a cup. And then guys, inside of our cup, we need some water. And then on top of our cup, we need a lid. And then inside of our calorimeter, we need two things. We need something that stirs, not much of an artist. And then guys, we need, a thermometer. <laughs> That's so bad. <laughs> oh, apologies all around. I think I can do better than that. Because that's not what they do. They kind of go, that's not better. That's all I got, y'all. Be gentle. That's a thermometer. So guys, if you want to label the parts, if you're not sure what they are, we've got a cup, we've got a lid, we've got water, we've got a thermometer, and we've got a stirry thing. And that's all you need to have a coffee cup calorimeter. Now guys, as we study this, there are some questions that we're gonna ask and answer. And I would encourage you to write these down so you see where this is headed. So guys, as we study this, the first question that we're going to ask 
is what is our system? Then we're going to talk about what is the surroundings. Then we're going to talk about heat. Then we're going to talk about what are they good for. Then we're going to talk about We're going to talk about how do they work. So what is our system? What is our surroundings? What then does that tell us about heat? What are they good for and how do they work? You guys ready to go? Okay. So guys, we're actually going to answer these a little bit out of order because I think it'll be easier for you to figure out how these, well, it'll be easier for you to figure out system and surroundings. If we start by talking, first of all, what are they good for? And guys, there's really only one thing that these are good for. They're only good for aqueous processes. That could be dissolving. That could be acids reacting with bases. That could be precipitation reactions, like the one that we looked at with silver ion and chloride ion forming silver chloride. But guys, all that these things are good for are aqueous reactions. There are other calorimeters that you can use in other settings, but they took it out of the AP curriculum. But guys, these are only good for aqueous processes, which makes sense, right? Because there's water in them. So now we can go up and talk about system and surroundings. So guys, when we think about how we use a coffee cup calorimeter, first thing we've got to do is we need to define our system. And guys, our system will always be the atoms that are involved in the reaction. Just the reactant and product atoms. Yeah? Well, but understand, like, when we said it was reactants, it's also then the products, because we looked at, like, CH4 becoming, and so we said this. I'm glad that you brought this up. Look, we said CH4 plus O2 yields CO2 and H2O, and that's not balanced properly. But we said that the reactants are the carbons, the hydrogens, and the oxygens. Well, they are. It's just over here, they're in different places, but it's still the carbons, the hydrogens, and the oxygens. Go ahead, Mark. Um, yes, absolutely, because they're part of the, even if they're not doing chemistry, they're still part of the things that are involved in the reaction, so absolutely. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, so guys, here's where this gets really interesting, and this involves some, some approximation, but guys, check this out. So if the atoms are the system, what then is the surroundings? Everything else, right? We understand that if the atoms are the system, isn't everything else the surroundings? It is. But guys, what we're going to do now mentally is we're going to take, this is weird, we're going to take the universe and divide it in half. This is how we think about the surroundings. So guys, if the atoms in the reaction are the system, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say that the water is the surroundings and then the styrofoam cup separates the surroundings from the rest of the universe. Let that soak in. So guys, what we're saying is that we are going to isolate our surroundings from the universe. And you know that functionally this is impossible, and I'll explain to you why in a minute. But guys, we are going to make a slight approximation. And we're going to say that our atoms are the system and that our water is the surroundings. And then we're going to say that our styrofoam cup separates our surroundings, the water, from the rest of the universe. Now, guys, you know that this isn't really the case, right? If you've ever put a hot drink in a styrofoam cup, why do we put it? Well, even better yet, 
I mean, let's take it one step further and let's go hydro flask, which is just a really cool styrofoam cup. So guys, if you put something hot in your, in your, in your flask, why do we put it in a flask in the first place? We're trying to separate it from the universe. We want this to stay warm, and this insulative thing does a pretty good job of that. But guys, you also know if you come back in a day, what's the temperature of the drink inside going to be? The same as the room. Because guys, we know that while a styrofoam or an insulated container slows down the exchange of heat, we're still going to get heat coming out of the container. So the styrofoam cup doesn't perfectly separate the water from the universe, but it at least slows stuff down to the point where we can collect data before the, all the energy is lost to the room. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're going to say then that our system is the atoms. We're going to say that our surroundings is our water. So guys, this then becomes the question, what's going on with heat? Heat is the exchange of energy, right? So where will the energy go from and where will the energy go to? From the system, which are the atoms, to the water, which is the surroundings. Now, guys, that begs one idea. What has to be true of our reaction? It's got to be exothermic. So let's talk about that first. So, guys, if our reaction is exothermic, the energy will go from the reaction into the water. How do we know that's what's happening? What will we experience? The temperature of the water goes up. Now, guys, this is a weird thought. Let's think about this. So if the delta H for the reaction is negative, and you might want to write this down with me. Guys, if the delta H of the reaction is negative, is that endo or exothermic? Exothermic. This is giving off heat. But guys, what will we experience as we use this calorimeter if the reaction is exothermic? Will the temperature go up or down? The temperature will go up. But that's the temperature of the water going up. And guys, understand that's not counterintuitive. The reaction is losing energy. Where does the energy go? Into the water. What happens to then the temperature of the water? It goes up. And so guys, the idea is we are actually tracking the change of the surroundings, the water, and in a minute we're going to use that to imply what's going on with the system. Does that make sense? So let's go the other way. So guys, what if delta H is positive. Well, if delta H is positive, this is endothermic. But then, guys, what's going to happen to the temperature of the water? It's going to go down. So literally what's happening is as an endothermic reaction takes place, the reaction is sucking heat out of the water and the water's cooling off. This is how quick cold packs work, and we'll talk more in chapter 19. Go ahead. that can freeze it? Oh yeah, oh absolutely. Yeah, no, no question. Yeah, I mean you get close with a quick cold pack, but there are definitely others that are so endothermic. I mean, depending, you can't like freeze a lake well, if you added enough reactant, but that would be bad. Um, but yeah, but potentially, yeah. So guys, do you understand this kind of weird dichotomy? That if energy is going out, the temperature goes up. And if energy is going in, the temperature goes down. The idea is that we're tracking, the, we're tracking the temperature of the surroundings and making implications about the system. Go ahead. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, no, but in, in a sense, but we don't directly touch them. We touch the water, and then we can figure out what's happening to the atoms. Yeah, definitely. Just a second, Jessica. Go ahead. So how do you really touch the water? You don't. And that's actually an interesting point. And what you're going to see when these... Did you, under, did you hear Susanna's question? It's a really good question. She's like, how do you only touch the water and not touch the system, the atoms, right? And so there, there's a couple things going on. One is we understand, and let me just draw this crudely. Um, say that 
this is our system. Those are our atoms. So we understand that energy, and they'd be spread out throughout the, throughout the water. So as energy goes out, um, eventually, say it's exothermic, as energy goes out, quickly the atoms in the system and the water come to the same temperature. And when that happens, we can then take the temperature of the water, and we're also taking the temperature of the atoms, but because they're the same, and because what we're looking at is temperature, I didn't write down the equation, Q is equal to MC delta T. Because what we're looking at is temperature change, it doesn't really matter what we're taking the temperature of, because we'll take the temperature of the water initially by itself, then we'll take the temperature later, and it is technically of the water and the system, but because they're the same, we get the same change. Does that make sense? Go ahead, Mark. You're okay? Oh, Jessica, sorry. Yeah? No, no, when bonds break, it's always endothermic. Yeah. Yeah. No, because the water is not necessarily a reactant in these. So we could be looking at an acid base reaction. So what if the reaction was HCl plus NaOH? forms table salt and water. Well, here we've got the breaking and the forming of bonds. And if this gives off energy, the water will heat up. It's exothermic. If this takes in energy, endothermic, the water will cool down. And it doesn't matter about the water. We're talking about the elements involved in the reaction. Does that make sense? No, it's a great question. Mark, go ahead, Levi. Oh, Emmy, or go, go ahead. Yeah. Calorimeter? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a bomb calorimeter. And that's the part we don't need. So that is what is called a constant volume calorimeter. The slang is a bomb calorimeter. And they took bomb calorimetry out of the AP curriculum. So we're going to skip it. Yeah, so we're not going to do bomb calorimetry. So guys, let me, let me turn this back to our last question then. Because the last question that we need to ask and answer is how does this work? And fundamentally, the idea is this, and maybe you want to write it down this way. So we've got a reaction. That's our system. And this reaction is exchanging heat with the water. Again, if it's exothermic, it is losing heat to the water losing energy through heat to the water. If it's endothermic, it is taking in energy through heat from the water. But in either case, we're going to say this, that the heat gained or lost by the reaction is equal to the heat lost or gained by the water. See how I said that carefully? The heat gained or lost by the reaction is equal to the heat lost or gained by the water. And guys, who says that those are true? First law of thermo. So we are going to say that heat lost is equal to heat gained. Is that okay? But guys, again, all of this begs which oversimplification? Exactly, that we're not losing energy out into the room through the styrofoam. So assuming that that's not the case, we can say that these are equal, that heat lost is equal to heat gained. Now guys, remember, we can do this, right? We have a way of quantifying the amount of energy that water gains or loses through heat, and we do that by replacing this with MC delta T. So we can't measure heat but we can measure mass and we can measure temperature change and we can look up the specific heat of water, it's 4.18. And by being able to do this math, we can then calculate the amount of energy that a reaction gained or lost. Do you see how that all fits together? Go ahead.
That's correct. And so, and this was the part that I started to talk about, Susanna, and didn't get all the way to the finish. When you see these questions on the AP test, there will actually be a blurb in parentheses that says, assume that the specific heat of the solution is equal to the specific heat of water which basically says we're going to take a little bit of a simplification and pretend like the water is the only thing in the surroundings and the atoms themselves are not gaining or losing heat um, through kinetic energy. So we're going to make that oversimplification. Go ahead, Levi. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing that's interesting. Great question. Because then what's going to happen is this is equal to the delta H of the reaction. So heat lost is heat gained, but we're saying that this reaction can't do work. And if this reaction can't do work, then heat is equal to delta H. So when we calculate the amount of heat that, say, the water gained, so it was exothermic, when we calculate the amount of water or the amount of heat that the water gained, that is equal to the amount of heat that the reaction lost, which is the same as delta H because the reaction can't do work. Does that make sense? And that's exactly where we're headed with this. So guys, let's do this together. I don't want you to try to do this on your own. This is everything we just talked about. We're going to solve this to wrap up the day. I'm not going to give you time to write it down. If you would like to see this, it's in the notes. I understand that these weren't posted, and that's my fault. I'll post two five gram sample of solid sodium hydroxide, and you dissolve it into a calorimeter with 100 grams of water. And the temperature goes from 23.9 degrees to 32 degrees. Calculate delta H. And Levi, this is where we get to your question. Calculate delta H in kilojoules per mole for the solution process. And then to your question, Susanna, notice what it says. Assume that it's a perfect calorimeter. Guys, that means heat can't get through the cup. Assume that it's a perfect calorimeter and that the specific heat of the solution is the same of that for pure water. So guys, let's draw a picture. Do this with me. Let's not use green. So here's what we got. We got our calorimeter, we've got our water, we've got our lid, we've got our thermometer. I give up on trying to draw it. And guys, what we've got here is 100 grams of water in our calorimeter. What we're going to do is we are going to dunk a 3.25 gram chunk of sodium hydroxide into the water. And when we do, it dissolves. And as it dissolves, does energy go in or out? Let's say it again. Does energy go in or out? What's the answer? Yes. Energy goes in the energy in is equal to the energy out. You can't answer the question. So let's do this. Does energy go in or out of the system? Well, let's look. So the, the water starts at 23 degrees, and the water goes up to 32 degrees. So guys, what happened to the water? Did its energy go up or down? Its energy went up. So what happened to the energy of the system? Went down. So this is exothermic. So guys, the question then becomes, if that's true, what is, and this is what Levi insightfully got us thinking about, what's delta H? Well, guys, the first thing, yeah, it's negative, but the first thing we need to do is let's calculate how much heat the water gained. So guys, to do that, we go Q is equal to MC delta T. Now, guys, be careful. What is the mass? 100 grams, 3.25 grams, 103.25 grams. What's the mass? What is absorbing the heat? The water. This is the mass only of the water. Then we need to know the specific heat of water. It's 4.18 joules per gram per Celsius degree. Then, guys, our delta T would be 32 
minus 23.9, which I should be able to do in my head, uh, 8.1 degrees Celsius. So now, guys, we do the math. 100 times 4.18 times 8.1, two significant digits. I get 3,400 joules. We don't need to yet. So guys, what we know right now is the amount of energy, what? The water gained, right? So does this need a sign? And the answer is not yet. Because guys, what we know right now is the water gained this much energy. But we're not done. Because the question is asking us to figure out this in kilojoules per mole of sodium hydroxide. So now we have another calculation to make. And guys, I think I can make it fit right here. So what we're gonna do now is we are going to figure out how many kilojoules a mole of sodium hydroxide dissolving can evolve. David, am I too low? Can you see okay? Am I okay? So guys, let's set this up. Where did these 3,400 joules come from? The sodium hydroxide dissolving. So guys, we know we've got a related quantity here, 3,400 joules. But guys, where did the 3,400 joules come from? Dissolving how much sodium hydroxide? 3.25 grams. So we know for every 3.25 grams of sodium hydroxide, we're going to get out 3,400 joules because we saw what those 3,400 joules of energy did to 100 grams of water. They made the temperature go up 8.1 degrees. Now we need to do some math. And Mark, here's where we need to convert because we need to convert joules to kilojoules. So 1,000 joules is 1 kilojoule. Now we need to convert to, from grams to moles. Sodium is 23, oxygen is 16, hydrogen is 1. That's 40. So 40 grams of NaOH is 1 mole of NaOH. Now we can do this math. And we get 3,400 divided by 3.25 divided by 1,000 times 40, and two significant digits, I get 42. Kilojoules per mole of sodium hydroxide. But guys, you ready for a sobering realization? If you were to do all this math on the AP test and write down what I just put on the board, you would get zero out of one for this on the test. Why? What's that? We did. I mean, we wrote down our equation. We set it up. There is no equation for dimensional analysis. Why? It's negative. Because the answer is negative. Because now we're solving for a delta H. And delta H is directional. Enthalpy changes are directional. It's important that we communicate that you get 42 kilojoules of energy released, exothermic, released for every mole of sodium hydroxide. See guys, this number doesn't need units because it's simply amount of heat. And that's lost by the system and gained by the water, the surroundings. But as soon as we focus on the system, now the sign matters. And if you don't identify that as being negative, it's wrong. Do you see the distinction? Okay, questions? Okay. So um, guys, here then uh, is your homework. And then also chapter 19 summaries in the same format as chapter 5 are due on Wednesday. Then guys, on Wednesday, we're going to dig into the computational side of calorimetry. And then, guys, on Friday, the fun and exciting world of chapter 19.